So hello and welcome to the video. I'm getting really, really close to 10,000 subscribers and indeed may well have got there by the time that you watch this video. I started this channel during lockdown as a way of doing something creative to pass the time and I never thought I'd get to 100 subscribers, let alone 1,000 and certainly not 10,000. So it's time to take this YouTube business quite seriously. To celebrate 10,000, I'm going to make a video, or perhaps a series, including a Q&A video. Please use the comments section to this video to lodge any questions you'd like me to answer. I did one of those to celebrate reaching 5,000 subs, which was nine months ago. It's really hard to believe I've doubled my subscriber count in just nine months. But if there's anything you'd like to ask, leave it in the comments below, and I'll do my best to answer them. But in this video, I'm going to answer one question that I am asked quite frequently, which is how on earth did I manage to afford to travel so much over 100 countries and 1.4 million miles? I must be independently wealthy, surely? Well, at the risk of spoiling this video and at the risk of disappointing some people, I'm not rich. I have had a couple of jobs which have involved quite a lot of international travel, but the vast majority of my trips have been self-funded, so as part of this video I'll be sharing a little bit more of my backstory. And that backstory will include the fact that I am an accountant, and as such I still crave structure. So this video is going to be structured around six ways in which I have been able to turbocharge my ability to travel. And hopefully at least one of these things will be something that you could think about doing too. So if that sounds good, uh, I command you to stick around. Hi, I'm Matt. I've lived in five countries on four continents. I've flown over 1.4 million miles. I've visited over 100 countries, every American state, but I'm nowhere near done. So subscribe to see where I go next and perhaps get some inspiration for your next trip. So I was born in 1971, and by the end of that decade, aged nine, my country total had rocketed up to three. Yes, it was a pretty slow start. The 80s brought my first trip to the United States, a family holiday to Florida, along with school trips to Belgium and Russia. Before the Soviet Union fell, the state used to subsidise school trips to show youngsters how brilliant communism was, presumably in the hope of developing a generation of young Reds in Western societies. Well, it didn't work. But Moscow and Leningrad were fascinating places to visit in the late 80s. So by the end of the 80s, aged 19, I'd visited six countries. Woohoo! As I said, I started slowly. I said six, but was it actually 11, because I had also been to these places, which aren't members of the United Nations, but they count as separate territories according to the Traveller's Century Club. This video will explain, but any traveller will quickly run into the issue of what actually is a country. So, for example, is Scotland a country? As a national football team, it has a parliament and it has a clear national identity but it's represented in the United Nations as the United Kingdom. There's no definitive answer to this, so what I do is I track my visits against both the United Nations list and the Traveller's Century Club. Into the 90s, and I read economics at university, not because I wanted to be an economist, but because it felt like a great way of deferring a decision about what I actually wanted to do for another three years. That economics degree turned into a job offer from Arthur Anderson. Remember them? They were one of the big six accounting firms when there were six of them. I accepted that offer, and although it narrowed my career path a little bit, it still left me plenty of options. And after completing a three-year training contract with them, I became a chartered accountant. Which is the first point I want to make, which is to pick a career that has the potential to be global. It may be a bit late for some of you to take action against this point, but if there are any youngsters watching, perhaps it's something you can think about. I think accounting may be the most global profession. I've worked in five different countries and have never had to do anything to localise my qualification. Now, I worked for companies as a commercial accountant, and I would certainly have needed to do some local studying if I'd have done personal tax returns or been an auditor but the qualification I ended up with made it really easy for me to move around the globe. It's trickier, but still entirely possible to relocate internationally with other professions as well. 
law, medicine, engineering, and even architecture all require you to do some sort of localization in overseas jurisdictions, but that is never going to be as difficult as it was to get the original qualification. I remember picking up a migration kit to Canada in the 1990s, and top of the list of accepted occupations was accordion maker. So in addition to the headline professions I've mentioned, there are plenty of other occupations that can bring a global opportunity to you through your career. The 90s also gave me an income, which brings me to point two, which is to take every opportunity to travel that presents itself. Some of my contemporaries spent their money on cars, some spent it on flashy stereos, some spent it on designer clothing. I spent mine on travel. So by the end of the 90s, I was living in Australia and I had visited 32 UN members as well as 50 Travellers Century Club territories. And on New Year's Eve 1999, aged 29, I was sat on the edge of Sydney Harbour watching the fireworks and worrying if that was the end of Western civilization because of the Y2K bug. Do you remember that? The 2000s were brilliant. By the end of the decade, I was up to 59 UN members and 78 TCC territories. I lived in Australia, Singapore, the Philippines and the United States during that decade and took every opportunity to visit places around Asia and the Pacific that were close to hand. And that arose both through taking work opportunities and through holidays. Which brings me on to point three, if you want to have a travel-filled life, and my tongue is slightly in my cheek. For many of you, this isn't or wasn't an option, but don't have kids. They're really expensive, and they're at least an 18-year commitment, during which your opportunity to travel and your ability to afford to travel are going to be greatly reduced. If you have three, four, five kids, you could be looking at 25 or 30 years of commitment. Yes, children can be a delight, and yes, they can give you grandchildren, and yes, they can look after you in your old age. All things that I'm going to miss out on from not having had any. But to be serious, I think the single biggest reason why I have been able to travel so much is that I haven't had kids. Another revelation in the 2000s, and point four on this list, is adventure travel. Kind of. I was introduced to a company called Explore Worldwide, which offer tours that are a little bit more adventurous. I've been with them on six or seven tours over the years, and they have taken me to some places I would never really have seriously considered visiting as a solo traveller. And I visited these amazing places on Explore Tours some relatively adventurous places on that list and you are paying a little bit more for the experience than you would be if you travelled solo as a backpacker. But the quality of that guided experience has always been well worth the cost in my opinion. This is not sponsored by Explore, although they are welcome to reach out to me if anyone from over there watches this, and there are other tour companies that do very similar things. And we're talking about semi-adventurous travel here. We're not talking about sedate coach tours filled with elderly people. But neither do they require machetes, ropes or snake bite kits. You get a bed in a decent guest house or hotel every night in a day that's usually pretty packed with activities. They are a great way of seeing some lesser touristed places without having to invest months in planning and research before you go. And there was an important bit tucked away in that last sequence, which is that I've never really done any backpacking. There is very, very little about that style of travel that appeals to me, except the low cost, of course. Sleeping in a smelly, cramped 12-person bunk room? No thanks. Into the 2010s, and two more points, the first of which I'm going to call Rituals. I moved back to the UK early in the 2010s and made a new friendship group, largely amongst expats and largely amongst Canadians. I'd not lived in the UK for 12 years at this time myself, so I considered myself to be an expat even though I looked and sounded British. And that friendship group developed rituals around a couple of annual trips, one to visit Christmas markets in the run-up to Christmas, and another to go somewhere interesting to see an ice hockey match or two. See, that's the Canadian influence right there. 
Each of those might make for an interesting video one day, but those trips took me to some really quite interesting places that again I probably wouldn't have prioritised had I been travelling on my own. And as both of those rituals have now died off as the people in that group have moved on, as expats tend to do, I do still look back upon them with huge fondness. For them to happen, someone needs to take a leadership role, but there's no reason why that couldn't be you. But if an annual boys or girls trip somewhere becomes an annual ritual for you, it can be a great opportunity to clock up a few interesting places each year. And point six is cruising. Now, this might be a little controversial, but I am adamant that cruising is a great way to see a lot of places in a short space of time. Pick the right cruise and you can visit seven new countries or territories on a seven day holiday. Plus, there's lots of food, there's lots to drink, there's lots of entertainment alongside the opportunity to visit some interesting places. I mean, what's not to like? Now, I've spoken to people on cruises who boarded without the first clue as to which ports they were going to visit. And I've spoken to people on cruises who've had not the first clue what country they are actually in when they get off the ship at a port. For them, and for a lot of people who book cruises, it's all about the experience, it's all about the ship, it's all about spending time with friends and family. And that's fine, but I still think if you are an active traveller, they are well worth a look. I always mention my Patreon group in my videos, and we've developed a great little community of like-minded people, several of whom have now booked themselves on cruises as a result of this kind of promotion that I give in my videos. None of them have actually been on the cruise yet, but I do eagerly await those trips to hear back from them as to what they actually thought. As always, I'll put the link to the Patreon group in the description below. Here's a list of places that I've visited when on a cruise, and I really don't think I would have got to more than a couple of these had it not been through cruising. And check out my Matt's Oceans channel for more discussion about cruising, and that's where I put the content I create on those trips. So I finished the 2000s on 71 UN members and 90 TCC territories, and all of those six factors continued through the next decade, at the end of which I was up to 94 UN members and 128 TCC territories. And I guess if I was to break my format and add a seventh point, it would be to start a YouTube channel, because that has given me the opportunity to visit a few more. And as I sit here today, I'm on 97 UN members and 138 TCC territories. I'll show you the full lists as I wrap all of this up. I haven't made this video to show off, and I really hope that's not what you think I've been doing. Travelling is my thing, and I've made a number of sacrifices to be able to have the experiences I'm sharing with you in this video. But I can clearly remember every one of those 138 territories, and I could tell you a handful of stories about each and every one of them. I hope I've grown as a person from every one of those visits, particularly from my visits to places with a very different cultural or religious background. The world is a complicated place, and the best way to understand it is to go and see it for yourself. So this leaves me with exactly 100 more UN members to visit and 192 more TCC territories, although I think it's extremely unlikely I will ever make it to any of the seven Antarctic territories they include on their list. I've not set myself the goal of completing either of those lists, although it is very tempting to do so. I did set the goal of visiting all 50 US states, and I did achieve that. But I did dash through a few places, and in hindsight, I visited Wisconsin and Arkansas only very briefly, just to tick them off, rather than actually going and experiencing them in any detail. Which I look back on now as being a bit of a shame. But I am going to continue to travel. I have made bookings that will take me to one more UN member and three more TCC territories, and I'm sure a lot more will follow. I am also looking quite closely at timing my 100th UN member in a way that makes that a little bit special. So there you go, my answer to the question of how have I managed to travel so much? And hopefully also a few things that you can think about as a way of getting yourselves out on the road 
more often. Thanks for watching. Please give this video a like if you enjoyed it. Leave me a comment either with a Q&A question or something about this video if you wish. Uh, my Patreon link is in the description below. Matt's Oceans will be linked below as well. And if you're new to all of this and you like what you've seen, please consider subscribing because there is a lot more like this already on the channel with more coming. Thanks again for watching. I'll see you all in the next one. Goodbye.